American Family Association of Michigan. He's a founding board member of the Michigan Freedom to Work, which I personally thought was an awesome, awesome bill that passed through. One of two co-authors of Marriage Protection Amendment, and just in case you guys don't know about that in Michigan, we did pass a law that says marriage is between a man and a woman. He's, he, last election cycle, he was a candidate for U.S. Senate. He was endorsed by the statewide coalition of four dozen tea parties. And I will tell you right now, I was fully behind Gary. I think he's a great man. And uh, whatever office he decides to run for, I will be a, a, a moving force for him. Because I think we need more people like him. And uh, if you think we need to make changes, and you need to become a moving force for whoever you believe is. Let's see. Gary Army National Guard, and he's a member of the Midland Baptist Church, right? Did I get all of it? Everybody, Gary Glenn. Yeah. yeah. All right, good to see those of you who are still left. I appreciate Kurt. You know, Dave and I said after Kurt and Tab spoke, why didn't they invite us? They said it all, didn't they? And let me uh, join those, and I hope you're among them, who salutes and says thank you to Dave Agerman yes. for the Santina yeah. State. I, I assume you know Dave was a fighter pilot. Now, fighter pilots don't blink, they don't run, they don't back down. And Dave has certainly proven that as the Republican National Committee. Also wanted to say thanks to Kurt and others here who were among those who supported my little adventure in 2012. Uh, wasn't in the Lord's will to win that, but I felt called to do whatever I could to help save my country. When I spoke at the first Midland County Tea Party rally back in April of 2009, there were 600 people there. The paper said it was the biggest political rally in county history. But it was that very same week that the Department of Homeland Security had put out a memo saying that anybody who was pro-life, anti-tax increase, or had served in our military was a potential terrorist threat. So just by being at that first Tea Party rally, you probably got on some kind of list. But I was at the microphone, so I might, I might have been at the top of the list. Well, all the more so today. You know, the camera angle is probably about right. Everybody look up, wave at the President of the United States. Which, which finger? Way to Africa. <laughs> if you hear that little bird before the missile hits, you'll know you're out at the list. And if you want to give some kind of salute to the President, uh, you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> We've heard a lot about the IRS lately, and as a candidate for U.S. Senate, I said I supported the fair tax. And there's no better reason today than what we've seen to reaffirm that kind of policy and shut down the Internal Revenue Service, period. Just shut it down. Yeah. All for that. We have a $16 trillion debt and growing. But that, even at that magnitude of debt, is not unsolvable. Did you know that in one oil field under Colorado and part of the Dakotas in Wyoming, just one field, there is three trillion barrels of oil, which is more than the rest of the world combined. It's under federal land, which is one reason we're not drilling it. But if we were to drill it and impose just the 12% royalty that the federal government gets paid when a private company drills oil under federal land, that one oil field in and of itself would pay off completely our national debt. Now, of course, if you didn't have people in Congress who would vote for limited government, that just means they'd put us into quadrillions of dollars of debt. But it is not an unsolvable problem, even that. Who stands in the way? The Environmental Protection Agency. I'd add that to the list. Shut that one down, too. Yes. We've got 50 state-level EPAs. We don't need a 51st. And before they devalue our dollar and double our gas prices overnight, I think we also ought to shut down the Federal Reserve Bank, Amen. which is yeah. federal. It's not federal. Oh, that's not right. reserves. Not a bank. Shut it down. And obviously, Obamacare, I think we ought to repeal and shut that down, too. Now, if, if you think that all of these are just impossible, pie-in-the-sky proposals that could never become reality, I got one word for you, or at least one sentence. 
Michigan will never pass a right to work law. <laughs> Well, you're going to clap for that one. That was good. If you heard me give a speech last year running for the United States Senate, and I guess this is the most appropriate weekend which I could make this point, I was raised by a World War II Marine. My father survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. I'm state chairman of the sons and daughters of Pearl Harbor survivors. The last December he was alive, and of course I didn't know that in advance, but I'd always thought about doing this, and I, it's one of the few times in my life when I distinctly heard in my spirit some instructions, and that was clear, simply, do it this year. And I don't think it's an accident that we happen to have the money, a little extra money that year from some extra work I'd done. The last December he was alive, I took my mom and my dad back to Pearl Harbor, stood in the same spot in the same street he'd remembered standing that morning at 19 years of age shooting at Japanese airplanes. Went out on the USS Arizona Memorial for the memorial service. My dad was one of 21 survivors who was there that morning. And he was wearing a purple leg only for the survivors. And all the admirals and generals and everybody of every rank that day saluted my father, former Staff Sergeant James R. Glenn. The last thing we did was go up to the Cemetery of the Pacific, there above Honolulu, and we found the grave of his best friend. He'd become best buddies with this guy from Oklahoma in basic training. They went to a Charlie Chaplin movie on Saturday night. They lived together in Marine barracks, but the next morning this young man was assigned to guard duty on the USS Oklahoma. And so the next morning he was killed we found his grave for the first time, and what I was struck by was the dates on the grave. Because I calculated it pretty quickly, and this young man was exactly 17 years and two months old when he died defending our country. I succumbed to one of those Ancestry.com TV commercials recently, and it had dawned on me, because my dad had always said, I wish I'd known how to contact Robert Peake's family. But he was a 19-year-old Marine over in the Pacific, didn't really have much action on the internet, even as an older guy before he died. But last Memorial Day, a few weeks ago, I went on Ancestry.com, I found this Robert Peak, and on Memorial Day I called up his 79-year-old nephew and told him the story about my dad and his nephew he had never met. And that guy was an Air Force veteran, had just come home from a Memorial Day service and said I'd made his day. So that was a neat thing. It was my father who taught me to love my country. And I believe that everything he taught me to love about America, our liberty, and our strength and our security, and our traditional Judeo-Christian values are at risk of being lost. In a way, we as Americans, born when most of us were born, could never have conceived possible in this country. The very ideology that we have sent men and women around the world to die to stop over the last 50 or 60 years, we now see being implemented from Washington, D.C. So I feel a sense of duty to do whatever I can to help preserve for my children and grandchildren, and i got two of those now, what I inherited from my parents. I assume that's why you're here too, and I thank you for being here. I also had a mother, obviously, who taught me. My dad taught me to love my country. He was a Christian man. But it was my mother who prayed with me when I went to bed every night and who read the Bible to me and taught me to love the Lord. And liberty and faith are inseparable. Right. One depends on the other. John Quincy Adams said, The glory of the American Revolution is that it connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the precepts of Christianity. And he was there, an eyewitness. This country was founded on some universally held principles of the American character. Yeah, it was Lincoln, the first Republican president, who said that it was God who planted the love of liberty in our hearts. And he said that under a just God, those who would deny liberty to others don't deserve it for themselves. It was Lincoln who said that he was driven by, to his knees by the conviction that he had nowhere else to go. 
But those were universally held values. Not just held by Republicans. It was Jefferson, the first Democratic Party president, who said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure if we have removed the conviction that they are the gift of God? Some of you may be old enough to remember, I'm looking around here, which president was it that on D-Day led the nation over the radio in prayer and said in that prayer that we were engaged in a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization. That was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, do you think anybody had to ask which religion FDR was talking about back in 1944? And which president do you think it was who said in his inaugural address, and there's only been one, that our rights come from the hand of God, not from government? Who do you think said that? Ronald Reagan? George W. Bush? No, it was John F. Kennedy who said that. And yet there are some among the Republican Party leadership today who openly argue that we should abandon the moral convictions of the Republican Party platform. For example, did you know that the Republican Party, founding, according to its founding documents, was founded for the purpose of fighting what it called the twin pillars of barbarism? Now, I'll bet you can guess what one of the twin pillars of barbarism was. Slavery. What was the other of the twin pillars of barbarism the Republican Party's founding documents said the party was founded to oppose? It was, in the middle of the 19th century, the debate over polygamy. So it is accurate to say that the Republican Party was founded for the purpose of defending marriage between one man and one woman. Yay. Now, given the call by some to abandon those principles, let me give you some numbers. In 2004, the polls found that here in Michigan, our marriage protection amendment was on the ballot defining marriage between a man and a woman. That two-thirds of black Americans voted for it. It passed in the city limits of Detroit and Flint and Saginaw. And two-thirds of union households in Michigan voted in favor of the marriage protection amendment. By the way, can I, can I get an amen? Can I, can I get an amen that uh, the Republican legislature has now put compulsory unionism on the ash heap of history? Yeah. And yet some tell us we ought to surrender our moral values. Consider this. George W. Bush supported the Marriage Protection Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. He's credited with winning the state of Ohio by winning 16% of the black vote when he only won 7% nationwide because there was a marriage protection amendment on the ballot that year in the state of Ohio. John McCain, on the other hand, was one of only six Republicans in the U.S. Senate who voted against the marriage protection amendment. And the polling showed that in 2008, 5 million conservative Christians who had voted for George W. Bush in 2004 they didn't vote for Obama in 2008. They just didn't bother to come out and vote at all. Five million conservative Christians. Now, four years later, polling indicated that another five million conservative voters who had turned out to vote for John McCain didn't even bother to vote at all in 2012. So from 2004 to 2012, 10 million conservative voters just decided that given the two choices offered by them by the two major parties, that they wouldn't even bother to show up and vote at all. So I suggest a different course. I think the Republican Party should stand firm in its convictions, and we should, as Ronald Reagan said, fly banners of bold colors, not weak pastels. We ought to be true to the Republican platform and its founding principles. As my wife says, we consider ourselves, we're not just Tea Party activists, we're platform Republicans. Yay. Which means as long as the Republican Party adheres to its platform, yeah. then we're Republicans. I'd say that if we're true to those principles and nominate candidates who uh, can appeal to Americans 
who have either voted Democrat in the past, like union members and black Americans. And if we give those 10 million conservatives a reason to show up and vote again, that that is the most logical and principled course to victory, not abandoning our platform. Now these are times that try men's souls. No question about that. But I just finished reading a book by that name, To Try Men's Souls, about the first time that was written by Thomas Paine. You know, we don't have to march through snow and leave bloody footprints because we don't have any boots. And we don't have to, like uh, folks did at Gettysburg, march across a mile of open ground into canister fire. And we don't have to hit the beach at Normandy. Very few of us, even today, have to bear the burden of fighting the war on terror. So surely, with our children's liberty at stake, we can do what little is asked of us. What is our duty? You know, this summer, and it may be in fact Monday, and if it's not this Monday, it's going to be the next Monday. One of these Mondays in June, the United States Supreme Court is going to issue a ruling on marriage. And where do we go from there? They may rule to overturn Michigan's Marriage Protection Amendment and 31 state marriage protection amendments and declare there's a universal constitutional right to so-called homosexual marriage in all 50 states. Let me read you a couple of things that some of our founding fathers said. Thomas Jefferson said about the United States Supreme Court, the opinion which gives to the judges the right to decide what laws are constitutional and what are not, not only for themselves in their own sphere of action, but for the legislature and executive also in their spheres, would make the judiciary a despotic branch. You seem to consider the judges the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. The Constitution has erected no such single tribunal. That was Thomas Jefferson, and he was there. And yet you find even many conservative lawyers today who say that five members of the U.S. Supreme Court, whatever they say is law, doesn't matter what the legislature says, doesn't matter what the president says, doesn't matter what millions, tens of millions of Americans say, five guys tell us what is and is not the law of this country. In fact, Jefferson said, there is no danger I apprehend so much as the consolidation of our government by the noiseless and therefore unalarming instrumentality of the Supreme Court. Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president, said this about the same question. This is in his first inaugural address. I do not forget the position assumed by some that constitutional questions are to be decided by the Supreme Court, nor do I deny that such decisions must be binding in any case upon the parties to a suit as the, to the object of that suit. At the same time, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, the instant they are made in ordinary litigation between parties and personal actions, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. So what if the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday says that the millions of Michigan voters who voted to say that marriage in our state is one man and one woman, the Supreme Court says, no, that's not constitutional. Tenth Amendment. Martin Luther King, in his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, said this about our Christian duty. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of law, just and unjust. And I'd be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree that with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? Here's the answer. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. 
I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. So what do you do if the Supreme Court says marriage is whatever anybody wants it to be? You know, Abraham Lincoln, as president, ignored the Dred Scott decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that said blacks were not citizens and had no protections under the Constitution whatsoever. Andrew Jackson, as president, ignored the Supreme Court decision on a national bank. So if five individuals on the United States Supreme Court this Monday throw out Michigan's marriage protection amendment, my response will be, and you can choose the word, you can call it radical or you can call it constitutional as defined by Lincoln and Jefferson. I'll call on the 31 governors of the states where the people of those states, by an average margin of 65%, have defined marriage as only between one man and one woman, to stand up and defend the vote of their people and refuse to acknowledge the United States Supreme Court's decision, if that's what it is on Monday. I want to close with this. by asking you to join me in prayer. And I'll remove my hat. Hallelujah. And that is to say, Father in heaven, we pray as did our fathers and our mothers before us that you intervene in the affairs of men and this nation. That you restore the American character, including as defined by the strength of our faith and moral values and purpose, with a conviction that then and only then, as Thomas Jefferson said, will our liberties be secure. We pray as our founding fathers did with a firm reliance on divine providence. And in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Woo! Good job, well, let me take one final 15 or 20 seconds. No, no. You live in Gladwin County. I live in Midland County. It is my intention next year to run for the open state house seat that, okay. rep <laughs> that represents Midland and Bay counties. Yay. So I will not be able geographically to represent you, but you can be sure that I will represent the principles and the values which we share. And you are close enough that I will certainly call or email you and ask you to drive 15 minutes down to Midland County Yay. to help us pass stuff out Hallelujah. door to door come next summer and Yay. fall. So God bless you. Look forward to working with you next year. Hallelujah.